Hello, my name is Deborah Bagore. Welcome to the Faculty of Education lecture for 2021. I want to begin by acknowledging that I am currently on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen peoples and very happy to be here. The title for my lecture today is Literacies in Education, Past, Present and Possible Futures. Now years ago, people talked about the three R's of schooling reading, writing, and arithmetic. Well, today I want to address reading and writing. Maybe I'll let one of my colleagues talk about arithmetic at some other time. So reading and writing as kinds of literacy I'm going to discuss first, and then I'm going to discuss some more modern conceptions of literacy today and in the future. First of all then, a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. First of all, a little bit about me as a literacy educator, the importance of literacies in education, how literacy singular became literacy plural, multiliteracies and multimodalities and how they really expanded during the 1990s in the schools, and then something about the so-called new literacies, information and communication technologies. Then I'm going to end by discussing some of my research as exemplars of multiliteracies and new literacies, and then speculate a bit on how literacies are going to continue to grow and evolve. So first of all then, a bit about me. Well, I started as a teacher of junior and senior high school, teaching English language arts, social studies, and drama in small town Alberta, and also in Calgary, Alberta. Then I became a visiting consultant, working with gifted and talented students of all ages. I got my PhD from UBC in the mid-90s, and then I started doing research and teaching at the University of Winnipeg, University of Manitoba, and now, of course, at the University of Victoria. My current research interests are in adolescent literacies, critical media health literacies, and I'm going to be discussing that phrase a bit later, new literacies that I've already mentioned, and Indigenous literacies. So, you always know you're at an academic lecture when the instructor, presenter, begins with some definitions. So, first of all, um, literacy has been defined as the ability to read and write. Another definition that you see very commonly, though, is that literacy is to be knowledgeable in a particular area. And you see various phrases around echo literacy, science literacy, emotional literacy, financial literacy, and there are many, many other examples. But here's a definition on the slide that shows you just how far we've come in the last few years where the idea of literacy has really expanded. And now we talk about being literate with print, media, and also with non-print media. And non-print media would include things like visual literacies and also audio literacies. So the importance of literacies to education. Well, there's a couple of quotations here from some of my favorite researchers. First one by Paulo Ferreri, who talks about the importance of the literacy process and that really you can't separate the literacy process from the importance of general education. They work together. And secondly, Powell, Cantrell, and Adams, who talk about the role of literacy beyond education and also in general society, and the power, as they say, of literacy to make a difference in people's lives. A few things then to start with, my literacy education beliefs. So having been involved in literacy education for many decades now, um, I have settled on a few things that I believe and that come through every time I talk about literacy or every time I teach a literacy class. First of all, I believe in literacy lessons that are student-centered. So rather than a teacher deciding what it is he or she wants to do, the importance of the student and thinking about the student and the student's strengths and starting there as you move forward in a literacy lesson. Secondly is the importance of the social and cultural influences. So what has influenced that student in their family, um, in the community that surrounds them, uh, in the media, and what about cultural influences on that student? And third, the importance of creative thinking 
and critical thinking. And how are we going to teach students to be critical and creative thinkers through the various literacies so that they can succeed better in their present and in the future? So first of all then, let's take a step back into history and think about literacy as print. So literacy obviously has that word letters right embedded in it. And certainly early literacy was thought of as only being reading and writing. And why was that important in the schools? Well, society believed that these were the two foundational skills of schooling for contributing to the economy. And on this slide, we see a sample worksheet that might have been given to a child um, many years ago where they had to complete the alphabet because of the importance of letters. Schooling in reading and writing then, a um, hundred or more years ago, focused on letters, words, sentences, and paragraphs. And that was definitely the progression. So letters were small, letters were built into words, words were built into sentences, then sentences into paragraphs. And it was seen as being a very scientific way to go about things. Because after all, little children needed little words, and as you got bigger, then you could introduce longer words, longer sentences, longer paragraphs. The Dick and Jane readers, and most of you will be uh, familiar, at least you've heard of the Dick and Jane readers, they first came out in the 1930s, and believe it or not, they were still being published in the 60s and being widely used in the schools. It's the same thing with spelling books. Spelling books were there to teach words. Students very commonly would get a list of words on a Monday and they would get tested on them in a, on a Friday. Literature interpretation was the main thing for older students. So students would use perhaps the Christian Bible in order to um, go about doing literature study or the Western canon, um, great novels like those of Dickens. You had to read them, then you had to write essays. However, very often in schools, especially in the younger grades, writing was often more about penmanship than it was about the importance of composition. However, language arts in the schools started to expand. So we recognized that there were two, reading and writing, there were two what we might call modes or language arts, and they were joined by two more. So now we had reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So these modes then were conceived of as being a kind of a web. So the web of these four different modes it was thought that each of the modes would strengthen the others and that students could be helped in their reading if they were allowed to do listening and speaking before they actually read something. And the word for this was integration. So integrated literacy lessons used several different modes in order to uh, put together a good lesson where students could improve their literacy in all four modes. Around this time, I wrote an article about viewing and representing. So viewing and representing by 2000 was joining reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Now we had viewing and representing, so we had six modes. Viewing is defined as acquiring information, appreciating and criticizing ideas that are visually conveyed. And representing is, well, thought of as the opposite. It's communicating ideas visually through a variety of media. And again, teachers were being encouraged to integrate all six language arts or all six modes across all subjects. So I went into a middle school to see what teachers were actually doing. <clears throat> and sure enough, there was lots of viewing and representing going on. And these are some examples. They were, students were analyzing the elements of fiction in a film. So they were, instead of reading a novel, they were watching a film to see who were the characters, what was the plot, um, what was the setting. They were predicting future events in a film. So a teacher would show a film to a certain point, turn the film off, then say to the students, what do you think is going to happen next? Perhaps the students would write down their reactions, that's one mode. Perhaps they would talk to the teacher or talk to each other, that's another mode. Or perhaps they would draw a picture to show what they thought was going to happen next. 
Another example is analyzing picture book illustrations. So there are indeed picture books for older students. And in this middle school, they were using picture books and analyzing them, looking at the different parts. Why is it this color? Why is this character so small and this character so big? So there, was, there were lots of viewing activities in this middle school. Representing in this middle school was also incredibly active. So students were actively involved in demonstrating in visual ways. So they were performing skits. So we saw lots of drama in the schools. They were retelling stories by drawing a series of illustrations. They were creating collages, so cutting up magazines, pasting them on a piece of paper to show what the theme of a novel was. They were performing tableaus of literary events, and a tableau is a drama technique where it's, it's like a freeze frame. The students arrange themselves to create a scene in a novel, and then they, they freeze in that, in that spot, and other students are asked to critique the scene uh, that's been created. And there are many other examples on this slide. So one of the things that the teachers at this research school realized was that indeed, getting back to our idea of the web of modes supporting each other, that viewing supports reading. So we know that effective readers create images in their minds as they read. And this is a skill that can be developed. And what the teachers found in this school was that by having students do viewing activities and doing representing activities, they were actually able to improve their reading because they realized, especially the weaker readers, that they should be making pictures in their minds as they read. So in the mid-90s, then, uh, a group of people called the New London Group wrote a very important article. Um, this was a group of academics from the UK, uh, the US, and Australia, uh, sadly no Canadians, and they got together and they wrote uh, this paper called A Pedagogy of Multiliteracies. And one of the main things that this article did was once again to emphasize the idea that literacy, singular, reading and writing, or as they called it, linguistic, was not the only literacy that was around. And they added to this list visual, and we've already talked about viewing and representing, audio, listening and speaking, and also three others which were brand new to the, by the time this article came out, gestural, tactile, and spatial. And here we see some illustrations. Uh, we see Mr. Spock with his very famous gesture. Um, we see tactile, we see braille dots on this, uh, on this keyboard, and spatial, spatial in geometry or spatial in terms of reading a graph and being able to draw meaning from that particular mode. The New London Group said that really there were two goals of multiliteracies. So why should we be interested in teaching multiple literacies in the schools. Well, the first one they said was that everyone deserves to have equal access to the evolving language of work and power and the community. And secondly, they said it's important that students engage in critical engagement, that if students are going to be able to design their own futures and achieve success through fulfilling employment, they need to have control of as many different literacies as possible. But the big question, of course, for those of us in education was, how are we going to implement this in the schools? So we started to talk more about the multiple forms of literacy. So especially with adolescence, which is one of my uh, main areas of interest, um, we knew already that students in the outside world, in the world outside the schools, were already very heavily involved in activities that involved um, gestures and visuals and listening and speaking and many things that were far less common within the schools who were still very stuck on the importance of reading and writing. And if there was anything else mentioned, it was 
considered to be very much a kind of fringe element in the teaching of literacy. So once again, I um, embarked on a research project. And for this project, I did some interviews with teacher candidates or pre-service teachers, as they called them in Manitoba, which is where I was at this time. Um, and I looked at what would these students, these students who wanted to be teachers, what would they think of the role of literacy across all the different subject areas? So did literacy belong in mathematics? So what about the literacy of learning to read a math equation or learning to read a number problem? What about music? Um, learning to read lines of music or listen to a symphony and be able to tell uh, what key it was being played in. What about science literacy? What about literacy in social studies and history? And I found that the teacher candidates, by and large, were excited to be doing this kind of work. They saw that it really expanded the range of pedagogies that they could use. <clears throat> However, some were quite resistant. And why were they resistant? Well, they said things like, it's not my job. It's the job of the art teacher if you want to do um, visualization. They said, it's, it's not my job. Why isn't the English lang language arts teacher doing all this work? I just want to teach fill in the blanks, mathematics or science or history. So moving to British Columbia then into, um, into the University of Victoria, I began to expand my research into the health arena and um, I started to talk about something called critical media health literacies. So I was interested in how adolescent students might be taught or might be engaged in developing a questioning stance towards the health messages that they were getting directly and indirectly um, through the commercial media and how they were doing this by using new literacies and multiple literacies. So what are the new literacies? Well, the new literacies are the information and communication technologies that mediate uh, literacy. Examples of this, social media, blogs, email, YouTube, websites, and of course the, the list goes on and grows all the time. Um, and the importance then of the, of the new literacies was that the new literacies combined with multiple literacies. And the new literacy scholars started to talk about how do we get the multiple literacies expanded through the use of technology. So a uh, research team that I formed uh, at about this time involved uh, my colleagues uh, Elizabeth Bannister, who was a nursing professor, Joan Worf Higgins, who was in exercise science, and Robin Wilmot, who was my uh, doctoral student at the time. She's since uh, got her, and her own PhD. Um, and we moved out into the middle school to see what would happen if we actually tried to engage middle school students in a whole group of literacies, so new literacies and multiple literacies. We used two apps. One was called iMovie and one was called Green Screen. Um, we had students create puppets uh, and draw storyboards and then create videos where they would demonstrate what they saw the impact of the media was on their health. So this is a, this is a sample of a, st a stick puppet done by a grade seven student. And you can see that this is a, uh, this is a wrestler, um, I'm, I was told, um, who has a beard and a very interesting mohair uh, haircut, big bulging shoulder muscles, um, and a six pack, which I think in this case is a, is a 10 pack and a green stick on the back, which is because if you're working with a green screen, when you put this figure up in front of the green screen, the stick that you're using to manipulate the little puppet with, of course, will completely disappear. 
So the next thing that we did was we embarked on another way that we could use multiple literacies, and this was by having students create comics or graphic novels. So we know from various scholars that reading comics involves complex multimodal literacies. Many people consider comics to be a very inferior form of literature. We certainly don't believe that anymore. And graphic novels and comics are certainly motivating um, in the classroom. We were able to use these as a way to develop uh, critical thinking and certainly by engaging students in uh, literacy education. So we speculated that if we allowed students to create their own comics and not just read the comics or graphic novels of others, that this would allow them to become designers and producers, which heralding back to the New London group um, is very important in the way students can develop. So implementing then multiliteracies and multimodalities was important in this particular research project as a way to get critical media health literacy into the classroom and the community. So the first project that we did was called uh, Chasing Adland. Uh, Chasing Adland was created by a group of adolescents at the public library um, right here in Victoria. Students signed up for this program and they created this story and all the visuals in five half-day um, workshop sessions, which is still amazing to me. Uh, they wrote the story, they created the dialogue, they did all the paneling, which are the names for the little boxes that you see in, in comics. Um, and when they finished, um, they set up every single panel. They posed it, the photographs were taken, and then I had enough money in my research project that I was able to, ha to hire a professional artist to actually do all of the illustrations. So what literacies then do we see in a project like this? Well, designing and producing, certainly. Creating storyboards, doing photographs, doing dialogue. We see multi-literacies and multi-modalities, uh, linguistic, visual, audio, and gestural. So they were, they were writing the dialogue. Uh, visually, they were figuring out what colors they wanted things to be how they wanted things to look, audio, they were speaking and listening to each other. Um, gestures, of course, are very important in comics to indicate uh, emotion and uh, the movement of the, of the plot. And we see here the six language arts, reading, writing, listening, speaking, viewing, and representing. Uh, the next project um, I undertook with a group of indigenous adolescents in interior. British Columbia. So this project, which resulted in this graphic novel called No Sale Skilep, Skilep was the local indigenous word for coyote, um, and in this one, again, the story was written, the dialogue was all written by the adolescents, the panels were all planned by the adolescents, and once again we used the technique of uh, acting them out, taking pictures, and then having it illustrated by a professional artist. Um, this one I find particularly clever because uh, Coyote is the trickster figure in the interior. Um, of course it's Raven on the west coast but Coyote here. And the students had a, a very conniving advertising executive who sometimes appears as a man in the story and sometimes appears as Coyote. But the eyes are always uh, exactly the same. So the importance then of, uh, of Indigenous literacy. So we know that in Indigenous communities that listening and speaking, storytelling of all sorts is a very important way to, to convey knowledge, um, that gestures and symbols, that visuals are very important. Uh, we also know the importance of family and community, elders, the land and the heritage language and we blended as many of these as we could into this project. Um, we had heritage language speakers come in to speak to the, to the students. Elders came in to, to bless the project at the, at the beginning. 
Um, we used the local legends, as I've already mentioned, the trickster figure, and in general used a variety of indigenizing practices in this literacy uh, project. So the third graphic novel project that we undertook, this one what marked a change because we were asking students to become the actual uh, creators of the visuals. So we had two groups of students. We had one group of Indigenous students at an Indigenous magnet school. We had another group of students at a nearby school who were taking art and that community was about half Indigenous and half non-Indigenous. The students who were creating the stories did all the storyboarding. Um, they they uh, sketched out what they thought the pictures might look like, and then they wrote notes to the art students who then um, actually did the work of putting the comics together. And the stories were all health-based as the students saw them. So this particular um, rather horrific picture is um, of a young woman who's at a party. She falls asleep and her so-called friends um, write terrible things all over her face, take a picture of her and put it up on social media. One of the other stories that resulted from this project uh, was called Nothing to See Here. And in this case, the indigenous um, adolescent who did the visual work shows us the picture of a very traditional indigenous woman. This story was about missing and murdered indigenous women and the uh, very clever use of police tape for the title, the yellow police tape with the phrase, nothing to see here which the students said was uh, an all too common phrase that they heard um, when an indigenous person had been involved in a, um, in a crime or an accident. So how do we see the implementation of multiliteracies then in this project? Well, as the new L London group would have it, this it certainly has linguistic elements in it, the story um, in groups or by the individuals. Um, visual, the visual mode now that it's all student illustrated. Um, they said it was like casting for characters, which they quite liked. Uh, it also uses gestural literacies, spatial literacies. But I think it also moves beyond what the New London group had to tell us because students here were representing themselves. They were using literacies in order to create new designs. They were combining uh, visual styles in order to represent themselves and their own experiences. Uh, the adolescents, the indigenous adolescents in this group certainly showed the importance of supporting caring in their local community. They said that these were the stories they wanted people to understand about what it was like to be an indigenous uh, adolescent. Um, they were very interested in power imbalances, for example, between adolescents and, ad and adults, between the police and adolescents, and the media and all the people that were in their communities, and they were interested in becoming activists. So expanding literacies then into the communities uh, we know that students have multiple community memberships. So they might be in a community of online gamers. They might also be scouts. They might uh, be the member of a church community. Um, they, adolescents, and certainly these indigenous adolescents, showed the importance of their interpersonal relationships within their community and how important all these communities were to them. And the BC curriculum has most recently then expanded the context in which students can learn literacy beyond the school walls. So now students are, are encouraged to go out into the community and to undergo um, and be involved in personal inquiries. There are, it has to be said, difficulties with implementing the multiple literacies and the new literacies in the schools. So uh, a scholar, Mills, um, observed that students too often, if they're seen as being behavior problems, then they're removed from visual activities. The visual activity she was referring to was 
claymation where um, little clay figures are created and then moved in minuscule amounts and a number of different photographs taken. Well, if they had behavior problems, they were taken away from those kinds of projects and they were punished by being returned to reading and writing work, which is, which is certainly um, an issue. How are schools going to work this out? In some of my research, uh, the research that I explained earlier when the students were creating their own videos, we found that often teachers were very nervous about the adolescent's ability to actually make decisions about how they were going to do these videos. And they were constantly stepping in and trying to help or restrict what the students clearly knew um, how to do the various kinds of things in the video that they needed to do in order to be successful. Technology is very expensive and in order to do video projects it costs a lot of money to have the technology to do that properly and many teachers feel that they just don't have the skills to properly assist students. Finally it has to be said that standardized testing still in literacy favors traditional print literacies, and we certainly don't see a lot of testing for listening, speaking, viewing, or representing skills. So what does this mean for the future of education? Well, first of all, we have to facilitate the sharing of technology expertise. So if we're going to overcome the problem of teachers' expertise, we need to make sure that uh, teachers have access to expertise beyond the classroom perhaps in the community or online. Um, educators need to be prepared to become expert facilitators. So if we're going to have inquiry uh, projects, then teachers need to be able to discover mentors that can help students. And they also need to be able to assess all the different um, literacies that their students are, inquire, are acquiring or trying to acquire. Helping students to challenge and critique multiple literacies is also important because they're not always neutral. Sometimes design, for example, in commercial advertising, is used to deceive and students need to be taught and encouraged to question that kind of, um, of presentation. So here we are then, back at the beginning, um, the two R's, two new and multiple literacies. Well, reading and writing is important in the schools, and it'll always be important. But the other four language arts, listening, speaking, viewing, and representing, have become much more important in the schools, and rightly so, I would argue. And competence across all the different modes, linguistic, audio, visual, gestural, tactile, spatial, helps to prepare students for the future, whatever the future uh, might be. We know that technology is going to continue to grow and to change, and that it will continue to have an impact on literacy. I also predict that Indigenous literacies are going to have more prominence, um, that we're going to acknowledge more in the schools the importance of story in order to transmit knowledge, and the importance of other kinds of literacy, like reading the land. And I also think that critical literacy is going to become even more important, that students need to be able to appropriately question the messages that are being given to them and to create messages that will persuade others. So thank you very much for your attention today, and I'd be certainly very happy to respond to any questions that you'd like to send me.